Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for not failing. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to gather here in your house today. Lord, please help all these people in the prayer list. Please help all of us have a good day today. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. standing around.
as you can see, I totally messed up on one of those verses. But you understand the concept behind that song, The Lighthouse. You know, The Lighthouse, it has a purpose. And so do we. Okay. Miss Betty Ford did have a mini stroke in there admitting her into the hospital. But you see, the lighthouse, its purpose is to save lives. <laughs> Guess what, y'all? So was ours. Amen. Amen. You see, and I told you earlier that scripture, Isaiah 9, 2, we see where it talks about the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. Now we know that Jesus is the true light. We see in the first chapter of John, we read where John the Baptist was called to preach the coming of the light. But you see, Jesus, he gives us some insight on who would broadcast that light. And that light that we are broadcasting is us. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, it says, You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all the men, unto all that are in the house. And let your light so shine before men that you may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Today, I want us to, this is what I want us to look at today. Is the light we're, going, we're giving to the world really the light of Jesus? Is our light growing dim or is it shining brightly? By the end of this sermon, you will be able to answer those two questions. And we're going to look in the heart of each and every one of us. But I want you to take a moment to look. You see at the lighthouse I have up here, even though it's just a little bit of model, it is the only lighthouse in the world that's actually painted candy stripe black and white. It's actually also the tallest lighthouse in the world. But you see off the shore of North Carolina, near the Outer Banks of the Continental Shelf, that's one of the most dangerous stretches of the ocean in the world. You see, over the last 400 years, there have been more than 300 ships that have sunk in that area. It was known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic. But what makes it so dangerous is there's a 14-mile stretch of a sandbar that's constantly shifting. And they call it the Diamond Shoals. You see, recognizing the danger in this area and need to warn ships, the U.S. Governor, U.S. government constructed a lighthouse in 1870. The Cape Hatteras Lighthouse is the biggest lighthouse in the United States. It is over 208 feet tall, roughly 12 stories high, has 48-inch thick walls. 1.25 million bricks were used in its construction. And its internal cast iron staircase to reach the top has 248 steps. But you see, what was the purpose of this lighthouse? It was built to save the lives and property. And when you think about it, the church has the same purpose as a lighthouse. <laughs> we do. We are to be the lighthouse to the lost and dying world. Because when you think about it, those that live out there in the world that are not saved, that are lost, they're walking in darkness. They can't see the light because no one's shining the light to them. No one's showing them the light. But see, that's where we have to come in. We have to be that light. And the biggest way that we are that light is by the way we live our life. Amen. You see, actions speak louder than words, and we all know that. 
I've been told that many times throughout my life and throughout my career in the military that actions speak louder than words. People watch you more than they listen to you. But you think about it. Have you ever been cruising through life? It felt like you were on top of the world and then boom, something happened and you lose it all and you're down at the bottom. That's what it felt like when they hit that shendos, that sandbar. They were just cruising along on the smooth seas and then all of a sudden those ships would hit that sandbar, shatter their holes and cause them to sink because there was no one to warn them of the dangers. That's what's happening out right out the doors today. You see, God has put a lighthouse in the darkness that projects to the seas of life. You see, just as that, that song says, you know, there's a lighthouse that overlooks life's sea. And that's what we got to look at today. We are that lighthouse. God has put us to reflect his light. When we think about it, the church, even though we may be small, has the same bright light that shines forth of those biggest churches in the country we have. Think about it. What's the difference between us and the big churches in Alexandria? Nothing. They have more people. We serve the same God. We worship the same way. But you see, the light that shines throughout any church should be bright. Amen. It should not grow dim. It should always grow brighter and brighter because that's what it's supposed to be. You know, when I was sitting at that little bit lighthouse up on the communion table there, they told me, you can't turn that light. It's too bright. We can't look at it. It just, it hurts our eyes. So I had to turn the flashlight down to where it doesn't shine in everybody's eyes. But guess what? That's what the light's supposed to do. It's supposed to blind us. It was just like Paul was blinded by the light. We too need to be blinded by the light sometimes <laughs> so that we can see how far away from the light we have gone. But I'm worried about one thing. The church has forgotten its real purpose for existence. You see, we have become what I believe that the purpose today is to, what people believe is we're a church to supply emotional and physical support to people. That's what they believe the church is today. They believe it's a, a place where you could go and get emotional and physical support. That's one thing, but that's not what it was designed for. Amen. That's not what we were put here for. We were put here to save those that are in the darkness. We were put here to be a light to the darkness. And listen, you can help somebody emotionally all you want. But you cannot. Just by helping emotionally does not get them into heaven. And you see, that's one thing where I've, me and some preachers have taught. And I've, we've had some disagreements because I've heard preachers say, well, I saved this person. Like, well, you haven't saved anybody. You led them to the foot of the cross, and that was where your job stopped. Amen. God took it from there. And see, that's the thing we have to understand. We can lead them to the cross. We can lead them to the moment where they can sit there and where they're ready to say the prayer and ask God to come in their line. But we can't force them to say that prayer. Right. They have to say that. They have to be willing to come out of the darkness. And into the light. You see, the thing about the darkness, and believe me, I lived in it. I know what it's like. The thing about the darkness, it's easy. It's fun. It's exciting. And it's got these big neon lights that attract you into it. That says, come. Come on in. Why? Because playing with our demons is fun. We don't want to let go of them. We don't want to give up our habits, our lifestyles. The things we do. We don't want to turn away from all of that. We don't want to look 
at the light. The light scares us. You know why the light scares us? Because the light is truth. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. You know, I'm a big Star Wars buff. Me and Ethan, we sit there, we love watching our Star Wars. And the other night, we was watching The Mandalorian. And one of the things that keep goes back to my mind when I watch this show, the main creed of this show, he says, this is the way. This is the way. What do we say as Christians about Christ? Christ is the way. Y'all remember what the very first church was ever called? The way. When Paul was sent, when Saul requested letters from the government to go get the followers of the way. Says it next. He was going to murder the followers of the way. You see that lighthouse? It shines a light to show us the way. But if we're not looking for it, we don't want to see it. We never will. And Jesus taught that the soul is more important than the body. We see in 1 Timothy, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that is now, that now is, and of that which is to come. And he goes on to tell us in Matthew 6, to lay not up your treasures upon this earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust can corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there it will be your heart also. The light of the body is the eye, and therefore thine eye be single, then the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, then the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in shine that is in the darkness how great is that darkness. What that is saying, you can't serve two masters. You either serve the light or you serve the darkness. You can't ride the fence. We have too many people today that live that, that go to church that believe that they can be fence travelers and ride that side of the light on Sunday, Monday through Saturday, hang out in the darkness. And they believe that just by saying, oh, Lord, forgive me, that they're safe. <laughs> Well, it doesn't work that way. You see, when it comes to repentance, there has to be a true repentance, meaning you have to turn away. You have to turn away from the darkness and turn toward the light. You see, when we as Christians, when we sin, it should bother us to the point where we feel like we need to stop what we're doing and ask for forgiveness. Because that's what? True repentance is all about. John the Baptist, that was his biggest message, was repent. Repent. They thought he was crazy. But he was more right today than he ever was back then. Today, this world is on a fast track to hell. And if people don't repent of their ways, then it's going to be too late. You see, if there's any doubt about the light, I want you to ask yourself one thing. Who was better off? Poor Lazarus in heaven or the rich man in hell? You think about it, which one served the light, which one served the darkness. Lazarus that had nothing and just begged for a crumb from the rich man's table served the light. And even though his life was hard, wretched, with trials and tribulations and sores and boils and all the things that he had to face, he still served the light. Even though he didn't get nothing out of it, he served the light. 
And what he did was he just begged from the, from the rich man a, a crumb. And the rich man wouldn't give him one. But when that night was over, it was a rich man begging Lazarus for a drop of water. Because he served the darkness. In Matthew 16, 26, it says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, we live in a world today where it's all about what we can get in this world. We have the best toys. We have the biggest retirement plans. We have the most energy. We have all these things that we want and won't. But what happens to our soul in the process? We worship our toys when we worship God. We spend more time with our toys than we do with God. You know, there's a church right the road. There's a sign that says, do you spend more time on Facebook or God's book? And that's true. We spend more time scrolling through Facebook, through TikTok, through Google, and whatever we scroll through. But when's the last time we scrolled through this and just stopped and read it? But you see, that's where the scriptures come from. That's how we're supposed to live our life. I changed the sign this morning, and one of the sayings on that sign says, study your Bible because Satan studies you. And it's so true. People say, well, I don't believe in Satan. Well, that's good. He believes in you. And he knows your every weakness better than you do. And guess what? All it takes, Mr. So Mate, they gave me some, some quotes a long time ago, and I'm using one. All it takes is you give the devil an inch, and he'll be a ruler. That's true. You give him an inch, and he'll become your ruler. That's all it takes. All it takes to get you into darkness is just that little bitty thing to get us there. You see, the church's purpose is to send out the light and to rescue the perishing. Y'all remember that song? Rescue the perishing? Yeah. Wow, whatever happened to that one? We send out the light through missions and preaching of the gospel. We rescue the perishing by throwing them the only life, real life preserver that matters, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are fishers of men, but we don't fish like natural fishermen. And we're never satisfied with the quantity we catch, no matter how many, how much the church grows. We're always expecting greater things and praying for a greater move of the Holy Ghost. And we're constantly throwing out the net, baiting the hook, and trying to catch every kind of fish in the seas. And then we can do and then we do all we can to see that none escape and go back into the world of sin again. See, that's the key. We can fish all we want, bring them into the church and bring them into the fold. But what happens next? You see, that's where we have failed today. You see, we are more concerned about numbers in the church, numbers on the roll, than we are helping those new Christians to understand what to do when they get out in the world. Do they know how to defend their faith? When someone comes up to them and asks them the hard questions of, if a God is so loving, why would he allow my baby to die? Can anyone truly answer that question? Let me tell you something. No matter the way you answer that question, it will not work. Because you can never give comfort to a family that just lost a loved one like that. It's a loaded question. But there's so many of them like that. But as a church, it's our job to help believers that are young to understand how to stand for those type of questions. To teach them. To show them what the scriptures actually are for. To show them how to live a good life. And let me, let me ask you, let me tell you this one. One of the questions that stumped me the most it's about an atheist. And he said, let me tell you something. If you knew 100% that heaven and hell was not real, would you still preach the Bible? 
Without a doubt, I said yes. Because you take the supernatural out of the Bible, it's still the greatest book on the earth on how to live your life. Because God wrote it. But you see, I know for sure heaven and hell is real. Amen. And that man today, he doesn't want to believe. I've worked and worked with him, but he refuses to believe. All I can do is pray now. Because God said, dust your sandals. <clears throat> Hardest thing to do is to walk away when God says walk away. But see, the light in a Cape Hatter's lighthouse is made so extremely powerful and bright that through the use of prisms and focus of the light, it reflects from mirrors to a central point or beam that is then projected in the darkness. Do y'all know what was first used in the lighthouse for light? It was well oil. Well oil was burned and produced the light. And there was a gas vapor that was used for a white for a while. And then came the invention of electricity. And there were several thousand watt bulbs installed that produced a light of 800,000 candles. And suddenly the light was much brighter. It could be seen for 20 miles out on a dark night. And this light in particular <laughs> flashed every 7.5 seconds. That's how they knew this was that lighthouse because of the way it flashed. Do you know each lighthouse has a different flash? But see the church, we have the brightest light of them all. We have Jesus. In Revelation, he says, I, have, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you that these things in the churches I'm the root and the offspring of David and the bringer of the bright and morning star. The gospel of Jesus Christ is called the light. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believeth not, lest not the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine upon them. You see, the light. Jesus wants to be that light. He wants to shine that light. But he needs people to broadcast that light for him. He needs carriers of the light. He needs someone to carry that light and send it forth. And that's where we come in. We have to be the reflector. You see, like you said, well, you heard me read and talk about prisms and the way that light is focused to make it brighter. It takes special prisms and mirrors and different things in the lighthouse to make that light so bright that it can be seen for 20 miles away. I mean, you just turn on natural light like that. It'll be seen in the darkness. But when you focus it and you make it with everything to amplify it, it can be seen way, way out there. Because you think on a clear, dark night, how far you can see a light. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that face in the face of Jesus Christ. But you have chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a particular people, that you should show forth the, the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been called out of that darkness. You see, one time we were all in the darkness. We've gotten comfortable living in the light and our little light of the, of the church that shines really dim. We're comfortable in that light because we're safe. It doesn't require us to get out and go into the darkness. It doesn't require us to shine because when we shine, people look at us. We don't like it when people look at us. We don't like being put under a microscope for people to inspect and say, well, if you're a so-called Christian, then why do you do this? <laughs> How many of you have all heard that? If you're such a Christian, then why do you do this? And I've had people tell me I'm a better person than most people in your church. I've never done this. I've never done that. I've never done that. That's great. You can be the Pope. But if you don't have Christ, you're still going to hell. Amen. Plain and simple. 
There's going to be a lot of great preachers in hell one day. People don't believe it, but there will be. Because you think about it, the Bible talks about false prophets. People that claim to be the men of God, but never accepted Christ. It happens. You see, if the light is to continue to shine and do its job, it has to have a lighthouse keeper. So what does the keeper do? His whole purpose is to keep the light burning at all costs. He has to constantly clean and maintain and repair the light. If the flame burned low, or the lenses and mirrors were dirty, or the wick of the oil burner needed trimming, he had to go to work because the lives depended upon him performing his duty. You think about it. Lives depend on that light. Lives depend on it. That lighthouse keeper will never know those souls that he saved by keeping that light bright. He would never know how many people made it through the night because of that light. But he did his job. He shined the light. In the early days, the lighthouse keeper, his name was Adam Gaskins. He was on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. He earned a total of $333 a year and a place to live. Due to his hard work and those that followed him, the lighthouse burned for 129 years, 47,000 nights without fail. These men and women that kept the flame were called the keepers of the flame. Church is here today to tell you we are the keepers of the flame. In this world that grows darker and ever closer to the shores of eternal judgment, it's our job to light that flame, to keep it shining bright. But see, the lighthouse was in trouble one day. It started to erode. And so the people talked about it, and they decided to move it 1,500 feet inshore to protect it and preserve it. But something happened. Something unexpected happened when the lighthouse was moved. It lost its purpose. The lighthouse was no longer a lighthouse at that point. It became a museum where people go to admire, enjoy it, learn, but it doesn't save any more lives. Because it was moved so far inland, its light can't shine out like it's supposed to. So they turned it into a museum. <clears throat> you see, up and down the East Coast, all up and down the East Coast, you'll see a bunch of yacht clubs. A lot of more lighthouse and life-saving stations that people forgot their purpose. Instead of saving lives, they turned it into a social club. The church has forgot its purpose. Instead of saving lives, we come just to talk, fellowship, and have a good time and leave. We don't want to save lives anymore. We don't want to deal with the dirty work that we're supposed to. We don't want to have to handle what comes with someone that's drug ridden, alcohol addicted, and a homeless person. We don't want to deal with that. We want to go home to our easy life and just live a good life and call it a day. But see, even though they moved that lighthouse, the original problem still six, still stands. The Diamond Shoals are still 14 miles shifting sandbar off the coast. That's still called the Great Guard of the Atlantic. The only thing then, after they moved it, the people just drowned. There was no life-saving ability anymore. With the shipwreck, the people just drowned. And they let it up, let them go. You see, church, we can't afford to let the light of the gospel die. We can't. Jesus is the only hope that this world has. When you look around, look at our world today. Just, just look at it today. 
It's the only hope. There's only one way that this world is going to make it. If Jesus is willing to save it. I've said it before. And I quote it again. Ruth Graham said it. If God doesn't judge America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because we're that far gone. We've been studying Genesis on Wednesday nights and we're going through it pretty deeply. And when you look in the days of Noah, how bad the things were when God decided to flood the earth. Jesus said in the days of Noah, so too will the Son of Man come. How far are we going before our light is, before God says enough? There's no other light and there's no other keeper of the flame. Jesus called you and I to be that keeper. That's what we're called to do. You see, the lighthouse gives us an insight of what our purpose is. You know, we've always asked that question, why am I here? What is our reason to be here? God tells you that right there, your reason is to be the light, to shine the light in the darkness, to go forth to find the one that needs help. We're to be the witness of love, mercy, and grace. We're to tell the world about the Savior. We're their only hope. You see, we carry the greatest message of all times in our heart. But we also keep it. It's the best kept secret of all time as well. I mean, let me tell you something. The people that worked at Area 51 can't keep a secret as good as Christians keep secret of Christ sometimes. Because they don't want to go out and share it. I was listening to a preacher one time and he said, you know, the people in the uh, church, he said, man, this is a nice church. You're really nice. And they said, yeah, we're the best kept secret in the area. They said, why keep it a secret? Let everybody know about it. But they didn't want to. They didn't want all the, the riffraff coming into their church. Setting in their pews, dirty in their carpet, staining their rugs. None of it had to do with God. You see, let us never lose sight of our purpose. Let us ever keep our eyes on our real mission. We can modernize and bring new technologies and innovation into ministry, but we must stay true to our purpose, and our purpose is to be the light. We must ever search for ways to bring the message and gospel to a lost and dying world. <coughs> because that's what our purpose is. I mean, you look and you go back to the words of that song that we were singing earlier. I mean, you look at it, it says, I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to him. How many of us understand that we would not be here right now if it wasn't for God's lighthouse? says, Jesus is the lighthouse. If it wasn't for him, we would not be sitting here right here today. Because think about what our lives were like before Jesus. Look at our lives. What was we like before Christ? Some of us were young and our lives were just fine because we were young, we were kids. We were saved at a young age. Some of us were adults that lived the life of the world. And God pulled us out of that murky, of that, of that just horrible, wretched place. He pulled us out of it. But when's the last time we thanked God for saving us from that? When's the last time we told you, thank you, Lord, for bringing me here today? When we woke up this morning, did we thank God for another day? Or we just get dressed and come to church? Because it's repetition. It's muscle memory. It's not worship. It's just muscle memory. It's an obligation. So I'll go back to the two questions I asked you earlier. Is the light that we are giving to the world really the light of Jesus? Is it? Are we truly giving Jesus' light to the world? Is our light growing dim? Or is it shining brightly? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. I can't answer that for you. I can only answer it for me. 
Just like I can't tell you, any, I cannot tell you that everyone here is saved. All I know is my heart. Each and every one of us have a personal relationship with Christ. And I pray that you do. Because if you don't, and today is your last day, there'll be no light to be found for eternity. You'll live eternity in the darkness without a light. That preacher that one time told the story of how a young man in church accosted him at the church. He said, I don't believe in all that. He said, preacher, how far is it from heaven to hell? Spun out of the church, left, made it 1.3 miles, wrecked his car, and died right there. The preacher said, that's how far it is from heaven to hell, right there, for that man. 1.3 miles. You see, most people will miss heaven and hell by what? 18 inches from here to here. That's the distance between heaven and hell. Because we believe it up here, but not in here. We don't believe we're saved, but we don't want to accept Christ. Because by accepting Christ comes responsibilities. And that responsibility is to be the light. To be the light bringer. To not just be the light bearer, but to carry the light for Christ. To shine it brightly for him. In a world of darkness. You see we can shine that light bright. But we have to be willing. To walk. In the darkness and shine it. Amen. That light can shine bright as it wants in here. Inside this building. But what's good is it doing outside the front doors. When we shine that light inside this church. And it just shines bright bright bright. What happens to our light when we get in our car. And head home. <laughs> due to budget cutbacks our light gets turned off because we're scared to sh spend too much time shining that light oh, one day a week is all we need is your light shining bright today if not only you can fix that only you can make that happen You see the second verse of this song. The verse that I actually messed up on. It says everyone that lives around us. They say tear that old lighthouse down. The big ships don't sell this way anymore. So there's no use in it just standing around. But then my mind goes back. To that stormy night. When just in time. I saw the light. But the light. From that old lighthouse that stands on the hill. Just in time, I saw the light. This song was wrote by Ronnie Henson, the Henson singers. They were at a Pentecostal church and they were singing and they were looking for some new material. And he went down to the bathroom, grabbed a roll of toilet paper, and penned this song. Never. In his life, before this song, had he ever seen what a lighthouse looked like. He didn't know what a lighthouse was. He didn't even know his purpose. He didn't even know what to expect from it. But God gave him this song without him ever knowing what a lighthouse was. After he wrote the song and he sang it, he got on his bicycle and rode 30 miles to the closest lighthouse to watch it. And he said, he says, I sat there and watched it. I felt in my spirit what God was saying. What a lighthouse does. Because he could see way out in the distance. The ocean. And how far that light would shine. Can people sit there and say that about our church? Can they drive up to the, to the end of the road. And sit there and say I see the light. I can see it. I can see it shining bright. I can see what they're doing for the community. Are we just like everybody else? Let's just tear it down because there's no use for it being here anymore. That is the philosophy of the world today about the churches. The church in the world today has no purpose. And they're just saying, just tear it all down. Just tear it down because it has no purpose anymore. 
but there's still a purpose. It's up to us. It's up to us to let them know that purpose today. Are you willing to let someone know about the light? Are you willing to let your light shine so bright that everyone around you will be blinded by it? That's what our purpose is today. Let us stand.